something to say. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Project Shadow number 560, Dark Dreams, Fernanda Parbat. I'm uh, I'm author C.E. Dorsey, but you can call me Eric, because, well, most of my friends do, unless I change my name to Charlie, which I've been thinking about doing, but that's a whole long story, and I'm going to save that for another time, because, <laughs> yeah, it's a long story, but uh, for now, call me Eric, because everybody calls me Eric. It has been a crazy weekend, still kind of reeling from uh, the death of Leonard Nimoy, because today, for the first time, I came into my office, and I have over my desk a beautiful, beautiful print of a painting of uh, Captain Kirk and Spock writing Puff the Magic Dragon. Yeah, don't ask. Um, well, do ask if you want, I'll answer that one i've answered before in previous podcasts but and this whimsical picture that i have up in my office suddenly became like this emblem of sadness and i didn't expect that at all so that that was that was a little more than i was ready for at this period at this point in time but hey you know we're gonna have to get used to the fact that Leonard Nimoy is no longer with us and that his Katra is on the way to Mount Salaya. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Back together. The, according to uh, Comic Book Resources, um, the the new J. Michael Straczynski, Wachowski, I'm going to say he's TV series, series, net series, whatever, Sensate, is going to be premiering in June on Netflix. This is going to be on June 5th. Um, they actually announced a whole bunch of people for, um, and a whole bunch of their um, release dates for a bunch of Netflix shows. And for some of them, I'm really excited, like Orange is the New Black, but um, I figured it'd be better to talk about that at a completely different time. So, go I will do that then. Um, I wanted to talk about this. We don't know a lot about this show yet. What we do know is that this is the first time the Wachowskis have done anything for television. That J. Michael Straczynski is part of this. It's going to be a sci-fi thriller. Now, let's just stop at J. Michael Straczynski. This is the man who gave us Jeremiah and who gave us um, Babylon 5 and who would have given us the most awesome reboot of Star Wars, Star Trek ever. If they had let him do it instead of giving it to, um, J.J. Abrams. Why is it so hard for me to say his name? Anyway, they gave it to J.J. Abrams instead and they did something completely different. But, um, the series Bible that he set up was leaked online and it really, really, oh man, it, it, it's a show that I wish was being made. So, what do we know? It's going to be a, like I said, a sci-fi thriller. Um, there are going to be eight characters that are um, empathically linked. Um, okay, they have the ability to access each other's thoughts, feelings, and deepest secrets, and they are hunted by an organization who wants to learn more about the power through any means possible. Okay, so that doesn't really tell us a whole bunch about the show, but it, it it's intriguing, right? Eight people able to know, you know, connected to each other and able to kind of know what's going on in each other's minds, their thoughts, their emotions, their secrets. That's kind of an interesting setup. Joe is really good at those kind of psychological thriller kind of things, so... I, I think he's the right guy to be doing this. That's J. Michael Straczynski. Um, I, I think he's the right person for this. So let's look at the cast. The cast is exciting, at least for me. Brian J. Smith 
is the first name that we have on the list. Um, he apparently is going to be appearing in at least three episodes of this series. It's going to be ten episodes in total. Um, he has appeared in several things, including on Defiance, he was Commander Gordon McClintock, or G Gordon McClintock, however you want to remember him on there. Love Defiance, great show. Um, I know him best from Stargate universe which i loved he was lieutenant matthew scott on that who was one of the main characters on that show and while i did not like him initially and i'll be very you know up front about that he grew on me and i got to see that he was actually fairly good at conveying emotion and getting me tied into his character so that's exciting he was also on an episode of warehouse 13 where he played jesse ashton so he he has shown that he is somebody who can be kind of a badass and also at the same time be emotionally vulnerable, which for a show like this is probably what you're going to want because, you know, this may just be me reading into things, but, you know, if the Wachowskis are involved, I'm just assuming that it's going to be, even though they're saying thriller, I, I am expecting it to be at least slightly action-y because, you know, the Wachowskis are involved. Um, also included in the cast is Tuppence Middleton, who must have the greatest, most British name ever. Tuppence Middleton. That, <laughs> that's great. Um, she is in one movie that I have, well, two movies that I have yet to see yet. She apparently is in Jupiter Ascending. She plays Kalik Abrax, um, Abrasax in that, which I have not seen yet. And that's not because of lack of interest. That's because... This is one of the worst theater areas in the world, and the theater is really hard to go to. So it takes a lot to get me to go to the theater to see a movie, and I'm much more of a renter. But um, the other one that she was in, which was a movie that I didn't even see come around here, which was The, Imi um, the Imitation Game. She played Helen in that. That was a movie I really wanted to see, but didn't get to. If you guys saw either of those movies, and you know her character, and you know how good or bad of an actress she was, please let me know because I'd be curious I'm kind of going through her IMDB and I'm not seeing anything else that I recognize her from so but if like I said if you've seen either one of those please 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 say something so that we can um get a sense for those of us who haven't we can get a sense of you know what to expect from her on this show um, okay, the next actor in the main cast is Amal Amin. Uh, he looks familiar. He was in Maze Runner. He played Albie. Ah, he was really good in Maze Runner. That was a good movie. I enjoyed that one a lot. Um, he played Albie in Maze Runner. He was kind of the leader of the group in there, which I'm not saying that that means he's going to be the leader in this, but he was sympathetic, but he was able to demonstrate a lot of um, strength and command. It was e easy to buy him as a leader. He did a really good job, so I'm excited about that. He was apparently on Harry's Law, which is a show I know a lot of people liked. I didn't. He played Michael Dave, um, Malcolm Davies on that. Not that familiar with that portrayal. And he was also apparently got his start on East Enders way back in 2003. But Albie was an interesting character. And I think it would one of the harder characters in that movie to flesh out because he had to be at the same time sympathetic and wow, I repeating myself, kind of sympathetic and a badass at the same time, and he found a way to do it. Huh, I wonder if that's going to be some kind of a uh, running theme in the actors that they picked up. Okay, Duna Bay is going to be in this show, and I am really excited about that. Um, she was in Cloud Atlas, uh, which is a movie that apparently a lot of people didn't like. I did. She played Tilda, Megan's mom, and a um, Mexican woman in there. You might remember her most as the um, robot who, well, not really robot, but the the person who kind of leads the revolt during the sci-fi portion of the movie she did such a good job in that 
I am excited to see what she's going to do in um, Sense8. She's, yeah, she was a very fascinating character. She was very, again, emotional and badass. I'm telling you, I'm noticing a bit of a correlation between these actors that they're picking for this. So, huh, I wonder what that means for the plot. Um, M uh, Miguel Sylvester is the next actor on the list as far as the main characters. He apparently was on a TV show named Velvet, um, which I now feel that I pronounced improperly because all of the episode titles are in Spanish. So that makes me feel that I did not pronounce it properly, but I don't know Spanish, so I apologize. Um, or if I did pronounce it pro properly, I apologize for apologizing that I didn't pronounce it properly. Um, yeah, if anybody is familiar with his body of work, definitely, definitely share. I think that I I would be interested in knowing more about him. I do watch a lot of telenovelas, but I have not seen that one. If it is one, I don't know. Um, the next person on the list is Tina Desai. Um, I know I mispronounced that name. Um, D-E-S-I-A, I'm sorry, A-I. So Desai, Desai. Um, I feel really bad. She is a Bollywood actress in, for most of her career, which is exciting, which is exciting to me. I have not seen any of the movies listed here, though. But I think that's interesting that they're bringing... That makes us kind of an international cast. And that in and of itself is interesting that they're bringing in a um, Spanish language actor, a Japanese actress, and a um, Bollywood actress to work on this. That kind of adds to the makeup and how the cast itself will be able to interact with with each other because having come from the different genres, I'm assuming they're going to be playing characters from the cultures that, you know, they are in fact from that could be really interesting. Cause that's something that doesn't happen a lot. And I don't exactly know why you would think that it would be more likely that, you know, if you were going to have somebody play a person from India you would want so someone who, you know, I hate to say it, was actually Indian, um, which that often doesn't happen. And that's even more surprising to me how often, you know, that gets played with. But um, as far as the other actors on the list, I am not familiar with the bodies of work of them. So I'm not really going to talk about them much. That would be, uh, Max Ray, um, Max Rymelt, Rymelt. I apologize. No, I'm mispronouncing your name, but remember, uh, yeah, I do that. And Jamie Clayton rounds out the main cast. Daryl Hannah, Naveen Andrews, Freema Hagman, <laughs> which you may remember from Dr. Who, um, and a couple others, have been scheduled to take part in the show as well. That's kind of exciting because, you know, Daryl Hannah is a really good actress and doesn't really get to do a lot. And a lot of that has to do with herself. She's fairly picky about what she does. One of the names that showed up that excited me for really stupid reasons is Terrence Mann is going to be in it. And he is an actor that, honestly, I'm not... <laughs> I may know him from more things than I think I do, but immediately I see him and my mind goes directly to um, the Dresden Files. He played Bob, you know, the, the ghost that lived in the skull in the Dresden Files show, which I absolutely loved. Um, he was also on um, Smash. He played Randy Cobra on Smash. He played Bob Ballard on 30 Rock. He has a wonderful sense of comedic timing as well as an ability to kind of be dark and brooding. I'm really interested to see what he is going to be doing. Um, other things that he did. Wow. I didn't know that he was uh, the voice of Oberon 
in the Gargoyles TV series, which is one of the greatest animated TV series made in America. And I will stick to that. <laughs> he was in Critters 3 and 4, which I would get struck off of my resume if I were him. And Critters 2. Yeah, huh. Oh, he was in Solar Babies. That goes back forever. He was Ivor in Solar Babies, 1986. Okay. Oh, and he was in the original. He played Ugg in the original Critters. So he was Ugg in all of the Critters. So yeah, there's that. But he was in Solar Babies. This was, oh, uh, okay. No wonder I just have this weird deep-seated love for this guy ever since I saw the Dresden Files. I didn't even re make that connection then. Um, Solar Babies, if you're not familiar with this movie... I don't know how to describe it. I made Brian watch it once, and um, I don't think he has ever forgiven me. This is a movie that came out in 1986, and it's basically the world has all of its water kind of locked up, and it's kind of this dark, uh, post-apocalyptic world. And these group of roller skating kids end up kind of saving the earth. And <laughs> um, let me read the official plot summary over at IMDb. In a future where most water has disappeared from the earth, we find a group of children, mostly teenagers, who li are living at an orphanage run by a despotic ruler of the new earth. The group is qu in question plays a hockey-based game on roller skates and is quite good. It has given them a unity that transcends the attempts to bring them to heal by the government. Finding an orb of special power, they find it has useful effects on them. They escape from the orphanage on skates and try to cross the wastelands looking for a place where they can live free as the stormtroopers search for them and the orb. Um, that was written by John Vogel over at IMDb, and I think that's actually a fairly good synopsis that doesn't give away too much. Some of the others do. Uh, Solar Papers was one of my favorite movies when I was a kid. Don't ask me why. I... I couldn't tell you. I still will enjoy it as an adult, but apparently it's an acquired taste because um, Brian Ray didn't get into it at all. So yeah, he was Ivor in that. That that's crazy. So Sense Eight is coming. It's coming June fifth, and it's going to be ten episodes. And if it's good and well received, it will get more seasons, as we know from what everything going on over there in um, Netflixy land. I'm excited about this. Netflix has been doing some really good original series, so I have some high hopes for this one. I love the idea that they're branching out into sci-fi, and I don't know. We'll be talking about this more in June, or if more really awesome leaks come out telling us more about it. We'll be talking about them then, too. Okay, I wrote a post over at ProjectShadow.com talking about the upcoming Crow reboot. And in the news, they may have cast a new director. They may have cast a new guy to play Eric Draven, blah, 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 blah. I, I, I'm starting to have a feeling that this movie is never going to get made. And if it does get made, it's probably not going to be very good. It has been mired down in this development hell for a really long time, which part of me is okay with, to be honest, because the original Crow movie starring Brandon Lee is one of those gothic classics that just transcends time. I watch it every year on Devil's Night. That's the day before Halloween. And it, it's been a tradition in my family. My sister does it too. A lot of my friends still do this. We watch it every year. And, you know, it still holds up. It's still a great movie. It's a great action movie. The story is really good. The comic is amazing. If you've never read the original James O'Barr Crow comics, you know, as I'm sitting here talking to you about this, on the wall behind my desk is a beautiful signed um, poster from the original Crow comics from part two, signed by James O'Barr, um, of the, uh, the beautiful My Valentine Has Hollow Eyes, which is actually the same image that I used in the post. So if you're not familiar with this, image head over to projectshadow.com and check out the post over there 
and you'll get to see what I'm talking about. Um, I'm usually against reboots, especially of movies that turned out really well. I think if a, if a movie's really good and it still stands up over, t you know, over the years, there's not really a need for rebooting it. I mean, I can understand some of the arguments that Star Trek needed a reboot because, you know, when it was made in the 60s, you know, it wasn't until the next generation that they actually started getting technology that was comparable to the technology that we have now in the 2000s because, you know, it just wasn't forecastable. You know, I mean, technology kind of swerved in a, you know, in a way that, yeah, going back and watching the original show and hearing them talk about tapes, it's a little, it is a little jarring and probably a lot more for younger audiences who are like, what's a tape? Um, so, you know, I can, I can kind of understand that. But when, you know, in most ways, though, I think it still holds up, especially when you look at the remastered version where they went in and redid the special effects and everything. It looks so good that, you know, just keep my William Shatner and Leonard Nimoy going, you know, and I'm, and then there are times when movies are really bad and I love the idea of them doing a reboot, so maybe they could do it better. This is one of those movies that I feel it was a great movie, but in some ways I feel like it let the original source material down because the book was so powerful. The, if, you, if you haven't read the original comics, definitely you have to check them out. Um, they, they're they kind of this hallucinogenic... I kept using that word in the post and I really mean it. This kind of hallucinogenic meditation on violence and love, duty, justice, and revenge. And what do those words mean? What is justice? What is revenge? What is salvation? What is damnation? What, you know, is love? Does love conquer all or is love an illusion? And it kind of tackles all of these questions through this amazing story of a young couple in the book who are killed in a freak accident. Basically, their car breaks down on the side of the road. A, a group of hellions pull up and basically kill them, steal their stuff, and run off. And some point later, Eric Draven is sent back from the land of the dead to exact revenge on them. That's different from the setup in the movie, and I think in some ways makes the story in the comic a little bit more powerful. Because what they did in the movie was it was tragic it was beautifully tragic but they gave a, a meaning to their being killed because you have in the movie you have Shelley kind of protesting the living conditions that they're that they're under and so there's kind of a reason for top dollar to go and kill her and have you know send people to go kill her just to shut her up and in the comic, it's much more just a random act of violence. And that randomness is one of the things that really plays into the story. The story is a very random collection of what's going on with this character, with Eric, as he is coming to terms not only with the fact that he is dead, but that his beloved has not come back to him and what they actually did to her. And so there are some amazing scenes in the book. You know, one of my favorites is, you know, the one that I just referred to, the My Valentine Has Hollow Eyes, which I call it that because that's one of the captions on the page, um, where he's in the house where they used to live, and he sees an apparition of his beloved, and they begin dancing together. And as he's dancing with her, he dips her at one point, and this beautiful woman melts away and he's dancing with the skeleton and it, it's haunting you know at another point as he's trying to figure out what's going on and why he should be doing what he's doing and should he stop doing what he's doing he has this vision of these mustangs running into a barbed wire fence and just getting torn apart by them and in some ways if I were to make a movie based on the source material, it would probably look a, li a lot more like a 
um, gothic horror action film version of Blade Runner than the movie that actually got made. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that Brandon Lee died. We know that um, they actually had a lot of those spookier elements filmed and decided to leave them out because Brandon died on set and they felt that it wasn't appropriate to do them in the actual movie itself. So they were cut out. Um, there have been various versions of the script leaked that ha have those original scenes in them. Um, I'm not sure which was the actual shooting script or if any of them are in fact real, but um, from the ones that I have read, you know, I have one that is purported to be the actual shooting script for the movie, and it would have really added a powerful dimension to the film to see the supernatural clash that was going on within him, the kind of metaphysical crisis that he was stuck in. And again, because the main actor died, they tried to cut out some of the morbidity of a movie about a dead man come back to get revenge for being killed, um, which I can understand. And of course, they had not finished shooting the movie, so there's no way of knowing how much of those scenes, how many of those scenes were, not, were left unfilmed. Um, in fact, there are two scenes, at least two scenes in the movie, two major scenes in the movie, where they digitally recomposited Brandon Lee, and while he appears in the scenes, he d either did not film them, or they repurposed f footage from another um, s shoot into the scene. Um, for example, the scene where he goes into his apartment for the first time was actually footage from when he was going down the alley towards the building, and they digitally composited him back into the apartment. Um, one of the other scenes was, of course, the famous scene of him looking out of the broken window, and that's actually a body double that they um, superimposed Brandon Lee's face on, digitally, you know, imposed, superimposed Brandon Lee's face on. So it, it's hard to know, you know, what the movie would have been like had he survived. But, you know, I think there's so much in the original book that I almost hate calling it a reboot. I think that the movie is what the movie is, and unfortunately it degenerated into movies that really weren't that good in the, all of the sequels, even though many of the comics sequels that came out were actually pretty entertaining. But they did what needed to be done, and they left Eric dead and went on to other crows that had been sent back to avenge their own killing. And I think that the movie franchise probably would have been better to play more with the mythology than with the character of Eric Draven. And I think that's where they went kooky and off the walls. Um, but yeah, you know, there's so much in that book that you could still play with that. I would kind of like to see somebody go back to the original source material and try to bring out some of those moments of existential angst from the book that are so beautifully portrayed in imagery that would probably translate fairly graphically, but really powerfully onto film. I think that that would be an amazing thing. So I, I'm not actually against them remaking this movie if they do it right. If it's simply going to be a remake of the you know, movie from the nineties, then there's absolutely no purpose in doing this. But if they're going to go back and revisit the original material, it's kind of like Dune, you know, Lynch made a great movie that leaves so much of the book on the table and kind of goes its own way. I would love to see a big budget movie, kind of like the sci-fi miniseries did, go and really dig into the book, you know. I, I, I think that you could do that, and I think you could do that respectfully. And it's not a lot of things that I say that about, so... Um, but I, I am really getting concerned about this movie in particular because they've gone through several directors... They've gone through several um, actors already, and that's never a good sign. So we'll, we'll have to see what happens. But yeah, not I. I hope it gets done. I hope it gets done right. But I'm not sure that this go around is the time that that's going to happen. So last week, I promised that today I would talk about 
the newest episode of Arrow, Nanda Parbat. I actually thought about saving this because we're not getting a new episode of Arrow or Flash this week. But then I realized that with Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. coming back this week, we'd probably be talking a lot about that. And so I'm going to get this in now before I get distracted by shiny things and start talking about something else. Um, the... Uh, uh, Okay, before I get started, spoiler alert. If you have not seen Arrow up to this point, then you and you're averse to knowing what happened or any speculation about what I think may be happening after this, you may want to stop listening to the podcast now because I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to go and look through... Um. I'm going to be talking about this and, you know, like I said, I don't, don't want to spoil things for you. So I'll give you a second. La, 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 la. Okay. Everybody ready? Alrighty. Let's do this. Okay. So see, this season has been insane. Season three for Arrow and Flash have just been a, uh, Amazing. They've been outstanding. I, I'm enjoying them so much. And when we get to Nanda Parbat, we have kind of... This is, for me, the episode where the season collapsed in on itself. And I mean that in a good way. Everything that has been set up since they started this season kind of all came to a head in this episode from Sarah getting killed to um everything going on with the League of Assassins to the sub story with um Maceo and Katana to what's going on with Malcolm and what's going on with Thea to you know what's going on with Diggle to what's going on with Ray Palmer all of the character story arcs kind of collided in this episode and everything went crazy. Now, I, I am blown away by what happened. And I, um, I don't even know how to talk about some of this. Um, the, first of all, going forward from here, from Nanda Parbat, the next episodes are called The Offer, which we'll talk about in a second because we know what The Offer was. Um, suicidal Tendencies. Public Enemy, Broken Arrow, and then there are three more, I'm sorry, four more episodes that we don't know the names of. So, okay. So we'll have to see what's going on with that. All right. So in this episode, we have Thea finding out finally that she's the one who killed Sarah. And this just messes with her head. And so she finds out, knowing that Malcolm did this, she turns Malcolm over to the League of Assassins. So, Black Arrow, out. Now, her brother and Diggle just can't let this stand. They know that, you know, she did this in a moment of rage, and if Thea is allowed to... If this moment is allowed to stand and Merlin dies, then... Thea is going to have to live with the fact that she killed her parents and Oliver knowing that he is responsible for the death of both of his parents knows how much that weighs on a person and doesn't want that for Thea because of course his father committed suicide so he could live and then his mother was killed because well hallucinating dead not really ever your girlfriend people make you go crazy and do stupid things um so he and Diggle head off to Nanda Parbat to get Merlin back. Now, for me, the biggest thing that happened in this episode, um, well, it was kind of threefold. You know, for me, there are three, maybe four things that just have to be highlighted that happened in this episode. And I'm going to take them in no particular order, but bear with me. One, um, Ray Palmer finishes the Adam suit. This is a big deal because now Adam is going to be a quasi superhero, a superhero in training on the show. We actually don't know what 
Ray Palmer is going to be doing with the suit um, or exactly what all its capabilities are for the show. And we don't know how well he will be able to implement the use of them. Um, so we will get to see that. But he took his first test flight in this episode and that was a thing in and of itself. It was exciting. I really liked the look of the armor suit. I think it looked good. Um, I, I, I really have nothing to say about it. I, there are several different versions of the atom. I think I know which way they're going with this one, but I'm really going to hold a lot of, I'm going to hold my tongue on a lot of it until we actually see how they implement him in the series, especially knowing that he's going to get spun off into his own series. And I'm really curious what that's going to be about. Um, other thing that we have to talk about is dude, Ray and Felicity hooked up. Like, I don't remember them hooking up earlier in the season. Like there, there's been some sexual tension between them, but they, they, they slept together. That that's a big thing. And that's going to drive Oliver nuts when he finds out. I mean, that, that we, we, we got word that he and Adam are kind of going to be after each other. And a lot of it was said that he didn't like the way Adam was going about his idea of taking out crime. I think that might be part of it, but I really, I, I, not to sound petty or to simplify a show as complex as this down to just sexual politics, but Oliver loves Felicity and so does Ray Palmer and he just hooked up with Felicity. So yeah, that's going to be a thing that that's going to be a thing. Um, next thing I want to talk about is of course, what happened in end of part about itself when dig and Oliver get captured yeah, Dig and Oliver got captured, and they are brought before Ra's al Ghul, and yeah, he wants to make him the next Ra's al Ghul. And I do say Ra's al Ghul, and I love the fact that the show uses both to try to prevent there being a full correct pronunciation. Um, I, I don't think there is a correct pronunciation of this name because... It, it, I'm not going to go into all that. It is it is the jife of the comic book world. I'll just say that. But, you know, seeing how... You know, see, this moment to me was amazing because this was bringing Arrow for full circle for me. Because the original character, the Green Arrow, was kind of a knockoff Superman... Uh, not Superman. Batman character who really was not differentiated from Batman at all for a really long time. And... This was, kind of, to me, like the revenge of the Arrow. Because this is taking for Green Arrow a plotline that has been part of the Batman plot for a long time. That Roz wants Batman to take over the Demon. And to take over the League of Assassins. And Batman won't do it. You know, this is why we end up getting the whole Damien thing with the kid and all that. Um, yeah, they're totally Batmaning. Arrow, and that blows me away. And I really wonder what he's going to do. I mean, of course, in theory, he's going to say no. But the idea that he... I mean, the idea that he'd have his own secret society out there trying to make the world a better place and actually make the League of Assassins do what it was originally intended to do is a very interesting notion, and there's part of me that hopes that it's not an immediate no and that we actually get some episodes of him kind of dealing with the league trying to get the league of assassins to not assassinate people because <laughs> he's all about you know we don't kill i think that would be amazing i i don't know i don't think it would go over very well but i think it would be amazing and i would love to see a couple of episodes of that and maybe that's what the episode suicidal tendency is about Personally, I think that's probably going to be Ray Palmer going and trying to fight crime for the first time because that's how Felicity refers to this desire to be a crime fighter. As I have, you know, I have another friend who's trying to commit suicide. I can't do anything about him, but I can do something about you. 
but I, I would love to see him actually give it a try. I don't know that they're going to do that for the TV series, but I would love to see them do that. And I, I just, I, I, I would love to see them try. I think that that would be fascinating. But again, I, I don't expect it. I don't think that that's the way that they're going to go with it. But yeah, I, I would love to see that. The last thing that we just have to talk about is Thea letting Nyssa out of the cage, handing her a sword and saying, by the way, you wanted to kill the person who killed Sarah. I killed Sarah. I wanted you to have your chance for revenge. Oh, my goodness. I mean, that is one of those moments in TV where you just kind of scream at the TV. No! And I kind of did. Um, <laughs> yeah, that happened. So, yeah, it's going to be very interesting to see where they go from here on that. But, yeah, it, it, we'll have to see how that goes. Um, I'm really excited to see where that goes. But, uh, yeah. My theory, which I believe I discussed on an earlier episode, is since the actress who played Sarah has been listed as being on the cast for the show, that um, the new Adam spinoff show, my theory is that she's going to decide that revenge isn't what she wants. She wants Sarah back. And they're going to go dig up Sarah and take her to one of the Lazarus pits and bring her back. That's my theory. Because if that's not what happens, I don't know how what they're going to do with the actress who played Sarah on the other show. I, I don't, I, I don't understand how they're going to get there unless it's going to be a part of that show. But I, I think that this is a moment in time where that could happen. Um, and the fact that the producers are being so sh tight-lipped about how the Lazarus Pit works, I, I expect to see the Lazarus Pit in this episode and um, in one of the episodes coming up. And remember, the last the Lazarus Pit in the comics has been able to revive somebody from the dead who's been dead for over a year and a half. So, you know, Sarah could is still in that window. She could, in theory, be thrown into the Lazarus Pit and come out of it alive. But she would not be Sarah Lance anymore. That's one of the things that they did to the Lazarus Pit is the longer the person had been dead, the less of them comes back. And I think that could be very interesting in and of itself what that means for the future of the character i don't know but i'm really interested to see what they're going to be doing with that and hopefully we'll find out about that soon well, this has been a longer episode um we're up to about 42 minutes at this point and i'm going to cut off all my conversation there because i'm trying to keep under 45 for you guys because that's what you asked for this is my first episode in a long time recording from my office and i'm curious what you think about the sound how we sounding we sounding good? Hopefully we're sounding good. Um, got the mic up on a new boom. Well, actually, it's an old boom, but... Um, <laughs> mic's in different place. The room's in different place. The acoustics are different back here. So hopefully the audio sounds good. Let me know what you think about that. And don't forget to head over to projectshadow.com and sign up for our newsletter. There's a lot of amazing things coming. And for everybody who's on the newsletter, you'll get them first. Um, but we will talk about that when it... As they approach, I don't want to spill too much of that too soon. And the main reason for that is I have two competing ideas, but I will let you know right now there will be free fiction heading out to the subscribers on the newsletter very soon. I'm just not sure which set it's going to be first. That's why I don't want to talk about it yet. But definitely head over to projectshadow.com, sign up for our news for my newsletter there. And you will be first in line for that. Um, in fact, tomorrow, well, Tuesday, when, depending on when you listen to this, I will be putting out the next issue of the newsletter. Probably talking about that a little bit in there. Um, but definitely keep in touch through through that. It's one of the best ways to keep in touch with everything that I am working on. Over there, of course, there's this podcast, which hopefully you have subscribed to in your favorite podcast engine of choice. Also at Project Shadow, you can find a link to all of my social media so you can connect with me that way. And of course, as always, you can go to my known site at projectshadowagenda.com. That's where you'll find the show notes for the, this episode, as well as my social link, my 
all my main social media stuff, everything about me, what am I doing? What am I up to? It's there because that is my social home on the internet. That's it for us today. I hope you enjoyed the show. I am so glad that we are back. I will talk to you all tomorrow. Bye.